We're so glad you plugged in today online at Cornerstone Church. Each message is designed to strengthen your walk with Christ. However, we do encourage you to be a part of a loving church home where you can build real relationships with real people and grow in your walk with Christ. We hope this message blesses you and we can't wait to see you next weekend. Good morning, Cornerstone. It's so good to see you today in the house of the Lord. Uh, I am hoping today that you have come to both receive from the Lord, but also uh, to give to the Lord. I have found that those two are often so interrelated that sometimes our blessings are contingent on what we do. We know that God will always be faithful to his end if we'll be faithful to ours. For instance, the Bible says, if we believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Notice, it is a conditional clause, if we believe. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear all the way from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even in salvation, there's something that we must do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The reciprocal is also true. If you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't be saved. Jesus is still the answer for the needs of the world today. Uh, we just heard a month's sermon on giving and stewardship. And we learned that if we want God's abundance, then we have to give and it will be given unto you. I heard the story of a pastor who said to his congregation one day uh, because he needed money to fix a hole in the roof of the church. And he said to the congregation, I've got bad news and I've got good news and I've got bad news. He said, the bad news is we've got a hole in the roof of the church and it needs to be fixed. He said, the good news is we've got plenty of money to fix it. The bad news is the money is still in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. Let me say that what we need to do as we come to God's house today is we need to let go and let God have his way and we need to live up to our end of the bargain and I promise you he will live up to his end of the bargain. If you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 16 through 18. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 16 through 18. Now, I understand the words are going to be on the screen so you can look up there and see the words also. Uh, before I read the words of our text, though, I want to share with you something I came across over 40 years ago. I remember exactly where I was, exactly what I was doing when I saw these words for the very first time. I was just a young whippersnapper getting ready to preach a revival at the Winter Garden Winter Haven Church of God, and I had gotten to the church early, and I was praying, and I was going over my sermon. You know what they call it when a pastor goes over his sermon? That's called practicing what you preach. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I was going over and, you know, so that it would be fresh in my mind, and I was praying, and I was seeking the Lord, and I was just walking around the church, and I walked out into the vestibule and noticed that in the vestibule there was a track stand, and in that track stand there was a track that I picked up and I read. And it meant so much to me that I put it to memory, and I want to share it with you today. It is called The Incomparable Christ, and it goes like this. He came from the bosom of the Father to the bosom of a woman. He put on humanity that we might put on divinity. He became the Son of Man that we might become sons of God. He was born in a supernatural way, lived in poverty and reared in obscurity. Only once crossed the boundary of the land in childhood. He had no wealth nor influence and no college education. Yet the profoundest wisdom of men has not yet equaled his last discourse in John 13 through 17 and his Sermon on the Mount. 
Never a man spake like this man. His relatives were inconspicuous and uninfluential. In infancy, he startled a king. In boyhood, he puzzled the doctors. Even at 12 years of age, proving he was far in advance of the theologians, for he was taught of God. In manhood, he ruled the elements so that he could defy the laws of gravitation by walking on the water and calming the raging sea. He healed the multitudes without medicine, and he made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, yet not all the libraries of the country could hold the books that have been written about him. He never wrote a song, yet he has furnished the theme of more songs than all songwriters combined. He never founded a college, yet no school can boast of as many students as he has. He never marshaled an army, drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun. Yet no leader ever made more volunteers who have under his orders made rebels to stack arms and surrender without a shot being fired. Great men have come and gone, yet he lives on. Herod could not kill him. Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. The grave could not hold him. And even the demons of hell obeyed him. He fed the hungry multitude with a little boy's lunch, broke up funerals, and gave back to life those that were once dead. But he laid aside his purple robe for a peasant's gown. He was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor. As to how poor, ask Mary, ask the wise men. He was laid in another's manger. He cruised the lake in another's boat. He rode on a borrowed beast. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Yet he conquered death, rose again on the third day as he said he would, ascended into heaven, and is today at the right hand of the throne of God, and will one day come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory for his own born-again blood-bought ones to be forever with him, after which he will judge the world in righteousness when every knee shall bow to him and every tongue shall confess him as Lord. His friends gladly, but his enemies seeking for a place to hide from his face. He's the ever perfect one, the chiefest among ten thousands, the only one who can satisfy the soul and give everlasting life to those who have it not. He is altogether lovely and he is my Savior. Amen. Hallelujah. I really wish I could give credit where credit is due today, but there was no name that was attached to that gospel tract. But I thought how beautifully that describes three aspects of the life of Jesus. First of all, in the preexistent past with the Heavenly Father in the fellowship that they shared together. Second, his coming in the flesh, which is the incarnation and the price that he paid for our redemption in crushing the head of the serpent, but whose heel would be bruised. But also it talks about that day when he's coming back again for his children, his own born-again, blood-bought ones to be forever with him, and then he will judge the world. Now that's exciting news. That's good news. But what I want to ask you this morning is, is there more to it than that? Is there more to it than Jesus saving us and coming back again for us? What about our life right now? Now, we sing about the sweet by and by, and we like the sweet by and by, and we like to talk about heaven, but what about the nasty now and now? Is there good news in the gospel for today? During this time period between our salvation and our rapture from this world, I believe the answer to that is found in God's Word. I have entitled the message today, how God helps us today. Because I think what people really want to know is does Christianity really work? I mean, when the chips are down and the heat is on and the pressure is mounting and the storms of life are raging and the trials are all around us, does faith in Jesus Christ really make a difference? And I believe that the answer from Scripture and in the lives of many people today is that, yes, it works. And in this passage, we're going to see three ways how God helps us. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. These are the words of Paul to his young son in the faith, Timothy. He says, at my first answer, no man stood with me. 
but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching of the gospel might be fully known, and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me unto every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now as a backdrop to this message, I want you to recognize that these words are part of the biographical writings of the Apostle Paul. It's almost as if he has opened his spiritual diary and he has pulled a leaf out of that spiritual diary about what he has gone through in his life. For when he writes these words, he is in his second prison experience. It's the second time he ends up in prison on, in trial. And he is looking back on that first prison experience. Now, at this time, Paul was on trial for his life. The charge was sedition. He was accused of being the ringleader of a band of insurrectionists. And the outcome of that trial was acquittal. That is, Paul was allowed to go back and continue his missionary work. But then he was arrested a second time. And he was transported back to Rome for trial. And sometime after that second trial... Paul is going to be put to death. He is going to be beheaded for preaching the gospel. Now, while he is in that second imprisonment awaiting trial, he's looking back on that first prison experience. Now, since this has to do with a trial, you might expect for there to be some legal jargon, and there is. There is some technical legal language that we need to understand if we're going to get the full meaning of what Paul's saying here. There's two key words. One is the word answer. And the second is the word stood. Paul says, at my first answer. And the word that is translated answer means to make a verbal defense on one's behalf. He's talking about the time when he was called to the witness stand. And he had to defend his own actions. He had to defend his own character. And he said, at the time that I stood there, no man stood with me. That's the second word I want you to understand. And that's the word stood. That word in the original language refers to the appearance of a person in the courtroom in behalf of someone else. That is, someone who is called to be a character witness. And so Paul is saying, when I was called upon to stand trial and defend myself against the charges of insurrection, nobody stood with me. No man stood with me. And then he makes a rather strange statement. He says, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Now, I can almost assure you that wouldn't have been my prayer. I more likely would have said, I hope they step in quicksand. You know, be, fess up, be honest here. You know, they could have stood up for me. They could have defended me. My friends knew that I was innocent, that I was not a rebel, that I was not an insurrectionist. But that's not what Paul prayed. He prayed, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. And then he turns to the bright side. He says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. I understand, he had just said that no man had stood with him, but he's now telling us, I want you to know, I did not stand there by myself. The Lord stood with me and he strengthened me so that I was able to proclaim the gospel. I was able to share the good news of Jesus. And then he turns to the future aspect of it. He says, not only did the Lord deliver me at that trial, 
But the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Now, in those three verses, Paul very beautifully tells us how God helps us today. If you're taking notes on the sermon, these are the three points. First of all, God gives us grace for the disappointments of life. He gives us grace for the disappointments of life. Secondly, God gives us strength for the trials of life. And third, God gives us hope for the end of life. And just as God helped Paul, he will help you. And so if you're here this morning and you're asking yourself the question, does Christianity really work? I mean, when the heat is on and the pressure is mounting and the storms of life are raging, does faith in Jesus Christ really make a difference? And the answer is emphatically, yes. He does help us in three ways. He gives us grace for the disappointments, strength for the trials, and hope for the end. Let's look at those three points right now. First of all, we are reminded that God gives us grace for the disappointments of life. Paul said at my first answer, that is at my first trial, at my first defense, no man stood with me, all men forsook me. Now that word that is translated forsook is the very same word that is found in verse 10. When Paul said that Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas was one of Paul's missionary companions. And in the heat of missionary activity, Demas left. He forsook Paul. He abandoned him. And Paul said, in exactly the same way that Demas abandoned me and forsook me, even so when I was on trial, my Christian brothers and sisters abandoned me, they forsook me. Now obviously there were some that Paul felt that could have and should have been there. They should have defended him. They should have been a character witness. But they did not. And he could have easily become bitter and resentful. But he did not. He refused to let those who let him down get him down. Listen to me this morning, church. He refused to let those who let him down get him down. He says, I pray that this may not be laid to their charge. Now, those of you who know your Bible this morning, you know that was not an original prayer. In fact, Paul had heard that prayed before about him. How many of you remember when that happened? Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He was stoned to death for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as they got ready to stone him, they picked up the rocks. The garments were placed at the feet of Saul of Tarsus, who would later have a dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus, and his name would be changed to Paul. And that day, when they picked up the rocks to pelt Stephen, to plummet his life out of him, this is what Stephen prayed. Acts chapter 7, verse 60. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, those of you who know your Bible know that that was not an original prayer with Stephen either. Stephen had heard that prayed before too. For when Jesus went to Calvary, one of his utterances from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
And I submit to you today that the same grace of God that worked through Jesus that enabled him to pray for those who were nailing him to the cross was now operative in the life of Stephen enabling him to pray for those who were stoning him to death and is now operative in the life of the Apostle Paul as he's praying for those who let him down and disappointed him. Now, guys, this is really practical because I'm going to tell you, as you go through life, people are going to let you down. Oh, me. Maybe it's just for me. <laughs> through life, sometimes people are going to hurt you. They're going to let you down. They're going to disappoint you severely. Sometimes it's a mate. Sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a relative. It might even be a pastor. It might be a neighbor. It might be an employer. It might be a Christian brother or sister. When that happens, we have two choices to make. We can become bitter and angry and resentful until it poisons our system and shrivels our soul like a raisin. Or we can forgive them like Paul did and Jesus did and Stephen did and ask God to forgive them. Now, some of you may be thinking this morning, but you know what? I'm going to hold on to my grudge. I'm going to hold on to that bitterness because you don't know what they did to me. Church, I'm trying to be as transparent as possible. There have been times in my life when things have happened that were so bad, I didn't think I could make it. And each of us have a decision to make when that time comes. You can either become bitter or you can become better. You can either act like the devil or you can act like Jesus. Oh, did I say that? You can act like Jesus. But it is true. Because during those times when you think that you can't forgive them, you can. Because God will give you the grace for the disappointments of life. He will give you the grace to forgive those who let you down like Paul did or those who knock you down like Stephen did or those who nail you down like Jesus did. By God's grace, you can rise above the hurts of life and you can learn to forgive people. One of the ways that God will help you today is he will give you grace for the disappointments of life. Second, not only will God give you grace for the disappointments, but he'll give you strength for the trials of life. Look at verse 17 again. He says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Now, he had just said that other people had forsook him. They did not stand with him, but he said, I did not stand alone. The Lord was right there with me, and he strengthened me through that trial. Now, please notice that Paul had to go through the trial. He did. But he didn't have to stand there by himself. And Paul is saying to us, the Lord didn't get me out. The Lord got me through. And that's God's usual modus operandi. He usually does not isolate us from problems, but rather he insulates us in those problems. He doesn't get us out. He gets us through. That is, he stands with us and he strengthens us. That's what he did with Daniel. Daniel was cast into the den of lions. His faith in God did not keep him out of the den of lions. And the Lord did not save him from the den of lions, but rather he saved him in the den of lions. The Lord got into the lion's den with him and he shut the mouth of the lions so that they could not devour him. Hallelujah. The Lord did not get the three Hebrew boys out of the fiery furnace. They had to go into the fire. 
He did not save them in the fiery furnace. They had to go through the fire. But the Lord got into the fire with them. And even though three were thrown in, the people say, we don't see three, we see four. And the fourth is likened to the Son of Man. He got into the, into the fiery furnace with them and he shielded them so that the fire could not consume them. The Lord did not rout David on some kind of outer loop around the valley of the shadow of death. David had to go through it. Listen to his own testimony. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What was David saying? David was saying, I had to walk through it, but the Lord was my shepherd. He was right there by my side to protect me so I could get through to the other side. I'm going to tell you that God didn't save Jesus. The Father didn't save the Son from the cross but rather he saves us through the cross. I tell you, there's no promise of scripture that God's people will be exempt from the trials of life. I have discovered that Christians get sick sometimes. Sometimes they have accidents. Sometimes they lose their jobs. Sometimes they go broke. Sometimes they die young. In fact, Christians experience every heartache imaginable. Health and wealth are not our automatic birthright. Strength and success are not fringe benefits that come through salvation. We are not promised exemptions or even explanations for the problems of life. But what we are promised is that the Lord will be with us in those problems and he will see us through it. He gives us strength for the trials of life. Listen to how he words it in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. The silver-tongued prophet says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. In the last message, I pointed out the words of Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. It is applicable here also. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He said, nay, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And friend, in your life and in mine, we may have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We may have to go into the fiery furnace. We may have to go into the lion's den. And when our hour comes, the Lord will be there for us and and he will give us his strength to help us to get through. He may not get us out, but he will get us through. That's how God helps us. He gives us grace for the disappointments of life. He gives us strength for the trials of life. And third and finally, he gives us hope for the end of life. Look at verse 18 again. He says, the Lord shall deliver me. Now notice that this help is not past tense. It has a future hope to it. He says, the Lord shall deliver me and shall preserve me. Now bear in mind that when Paul writes these words, death is imminent. That is, it is at hand. He knows this. He knows his days are few. He has just said in this very same chapter, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his 
appearing. You see, when Paul wrote these words, he was running out of time. But he was not running out of hope. And it is always that way with the people of God. All of us, all of us eventually run out of time. George Bernard Shaw was right when he said, life's ultimate statistic is the same for all. One out of one dies. Doesn't matter how much faith you have. We all eventually run out of time. But I want to tell you, if Christ is the Lord of your life, you may run out of time, but you'll never run out of hope. I want to close with this illustration. It's a true story that was told by a pastor. I heard him share this story. It's a story of a young man whose name was Danny. Danny attended a church college in Texas, and during the summer, he worked as a youth director at the First Baptist Church of Lake Jackson, Texas. That first summer, he met a beautiful young girl by the name of Joy. He was immediately impressed by her beauty, her dedication to Christ, her intelligence, her energy. And each year he saw her grow, both physically and spiritually. When he returned to school, after the third summer, he wasn't back at school long before he got the news that Joy had been diagnosed with cancer of the pancreas. As soon as he was able to get away from his college responsibilities, he went back to Lake Jackson, Texas. And he went to the hospital where Joy was. By that time, the ravages of the disease had taken a terrible toll on her body. And they sat there and they talked for a while about trivial things. They talked about the past. They talked about their good times vacation Bible school and activities with the youth group, but then the conversation turned to a more serious vein. And Joy said to Danny these words, Danny, do you know what it is like to run out of hope? Now you have to understand, this is just a young college boy. He's not walked through the valley of the shadow of death before. He hasn't dealt with any of the difficult problems of life. He hasn't grappled with those difficult decisions. And here's a young lady laying in the bed in front of him, dying of pancreatic cancer, asking him, Danny, do you know what it's like to run out of hope? And he bowed his head and he looked at the floor for a long time. And finally he looked up and he said, No, Joy, I don't know what it's like to run out of hope. And Joy said, Neither do I. You see, when Christ is your Savior, you may run out of time but you never run out of hope. And so you ask me this morning, does Christianity really work? I mean, when the chips are down and the heat is on and the pressure is mounting and the storms of life are raging, does faith in Jesus Christ really make a difference? And the answer from Scripture and from the life of the Apostle Paul is yes, it does work. God gives us grace for the disappointments, strength for the trials, and hope for the end. But you must come to Christ. It is a condition. You must come to Him. It is a personal, decisive act. I remember a long time ago, Dr. D. James Kennedy came out with what was known as evangelism explosion. And it basically taught Christians how to share the gospel, how you share your testimony, and you lead up with two questions. And those questions, 
They're masterpieces. They really are. The two questions this morning are this. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? And some people are going to say, yes, I know. Some people are going to say, I think I know. And some people are going to say, I'm not ready. But the second question really pinpoints it. The second question is, okay, you die, you go to heaven, you stand before the Lord, and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? How would you respond? And you would be shocked at how many people will say, well, because I try to live right, and I try to say the right thing, and I try to do the right thing, and I try to live by the golden rule, and I've done this, and I've done that. Listen, if that's what you're trusting in, you're trusting in the wrong thing. There's only, there's only one way, and that is trusting not in your own unrighteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the precious Lamb of God, who came and paid the price for us. If you're trusting in anything else, you're trusting in the wrong thing. As the old song says, it's so true. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. What are you trusting in today? If you haven't confessed Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, that's the decision that you need to make to make heaven your home. Hey guys, we're so glad you plugged into this week's message. We want to connect with you. Check us out at cornerstonechurch.co. Can't wait to see you next weekend.